reconnect. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. So we're here. Yeah. And yes, this is live. Okay. Um, and will we see when people start following? There we go. Okay. There we are. All right. Okay. So here we are. Uh, my name is Julian Chambliss. I'm professor of history at Rollins College. Um, I'm Bill Spitowski. I'm a librarian at Rollins. And we're here to do a lot of Q&A for... Uh, the book that we just co-edited with Daniel Fandino, and that book is, of course, called Assembling the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? So, um, we are here to answer questions and talk a little bit about the origins of the book and the premise behind it. So, I'm going to be looking down constantly because I'm going to be looking for people with questions and also ginning up attention for people. Um, so, <laughs> don't think like I don't care, it's because I have to do, I, wow, thanks, thanks. <laughs> this is, this is our relationship, knife and back, all the time. Um, so, <laughs> thanks for that, that demo, I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, Bill is going to start off, talk a little bit as I gin up uh, people's attention here, so like, go Bill, go. All right. Um, so, uh, the origins of this project, uh, uh, years ago, Julian and I, uh, taught a, uh, a class on comic books in American history, which we've done a number of times, uh, since then, but, uh, we taught, I taught this class, and we really wanted a sampling of different perspectives on comics, different periods of comics history, different disciplinary approaches, and went looking for a collection of essays in that vein, and there was none. So we decided we better create one. And that led to our uh, first uh, collection of uh, edited essays, which was... Uh, uh, you forgot. Of... <laughs> just... Ages of heroes, eras of men, superheroes <laughs> in the American, American experience. experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we were able to, to, to do this in part because... We were participating, primarily I was participating in the Rollins Conference course, which is a course that every freshman, first year student at Rollins has to take. This is a course that's open to the expertise of any faculty member. And when they asked me, I said, well, I can do anything, right? And they said, yes. I said, anything? And they said, yeah, anything. And then I turned to Bill and said, we're going to do a class on comic books. And I told them, and they were like, no, that's not what we meant when we said anything. But we won them over because the class was, in fact, quite engaging. And as Bill said, when we were playing that class, we did not find what we thought would be obvious to find at some level, a collection of essays that would be great in the classroom for a 15-week semester course that dealt with superheroes. So we decided to, to make that uh, after we taught the class really for the first time because we felt like this is an obvious thing. Um, and for those of you out there who, who've ever done the job of editing a volume, you realize how foolish we were when we, we started this project, but nonetheless, we were committed. And so, uh, eventually that collection did come out, and it was quite, quite a good collection, and almost immediately thereafter, and almost in the midst of it coming out, a bunch of other collections came out, and it was actually kind of funny because it seemed like, well, we were just following the crowd, but arguably... We felt like, you know, the whole reason we were doing this was because we thought this was a really important uh, project for the classroom. Uh, so that, that collection was successful, I would argue. Um, so that is one of the things that uh, drove the collection. And, oh, we got our first question. So uh, I have a question for Jonathan Harwell. Thank you for asking the question, Jonathan. And Jonathan said, Black Panther is now in the Cinematic Universe Spotlight. Which other characters, Marvel or otherwise, do each of you think deserve the head of their time and the spotlight the most? Or haven't yet um, 
had that. Wow. Um, uh, well, I mean, forthcoming is Captain Marvel, which is a big one. I think there's uh, certainly uh, Marvel needs to Im improve its uh, representation of women in uh, comics, and, she, and she's a good character. Um, I'd love to see Moon Knight. Moon Knight would be a great character, right? Um, I think the character that, given the way the Marvel Cinematic Universe has sort of played itself out right now, um, in the movies, I expect to see a character like perhaps like Black Goliath be added on. In fact, he's the the character Bill Foster is going to be Ant Man Wasp. I like to see more with the Falcon since he's the first African American superhero for Marvel. Um, in terms of like under underdeveloped characters, we haven't yeah. seen yet. Uh, I'm really thinking about this in terms of like what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is. So I think I would like to see something around Project Pegasus. Uh, those well, characters, the, right? yeah, yeah. That's that's something that would fit into the scientific framework of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And you know, Marvel Two and One. Um, mm -hmm. That was an, 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 the, the, the that was a series that started the thing in the '70s. That was often centered around Project Pegasus, which was an energy project. Run by the Department of Energy. Black Alive was a recurring character there. The Thing was a recurring character there, and lots of characters um, appear there. So, part of the reason I'm answering this way is because I'm trying to think about how the Marvel Cinematic Universe is operating and it operates on this emphasis of science as a foundation. They scratch that a lot, and I think this is one. Yeah, of my thing. chapter in the book is about how far that gets stretched, right? And how they've uh, moved in more mystical directions. Uh, but that's a, a way I could see in the way they frame it. Uh, to make that that engagement work, so uh, I would say that that's something that I would I would think would make a lot of sense in the way they would approach things. But we'll see. Okay, we got we have another question from Michael Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Michael, for asking this question. He says um, superheroes have always connected reality and fantasy, but with such extraordinary special effects as the cinematic universe now offers. Does that, does that reality fantasy relationship have a new quality beyond the conjecture by comic book reading culture? That's a really good question. That's, yeah, that's an interesting point. Because I, I think for years, comics had a, a niche that, that movies couldn't fill, that comics could do things that special effects weren't up to handling. And there isn't much that CGI can't do in a relatively dignified manner on the screen now. Um... Uh, but, uh, but I think there's, I mean, there's still a lot that can happen, uh, visually on screen. I'd, I'd like to see, com uh, see movie, comics movies get more eclectic, and I think we're starting to see that in things like the Legion TV series, and that's what I'd love to see in Moon Knight. Uh, the, the MCU is only going to get so edgy, they know they have a, a commercial, uh, demographic, uh, they're, 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 they aim to be fun, but if you look at Netflix, they've gotten a lot grittier there. I think I'm yeah. off, the, off the question here. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things about um, this idea of reality versus fantasy is that a, a central aim for the Marvel Cinematic Universe is the groundedness in the, the fantasy that you're seeing. So I think one of the things that was a real test for them, and they succeeded first with Thor and then with Doctor Strange, is... How do you make some of the elements that we might associate with the classic art, artistic interpretation of someone like Steve Ditko? How do you move that to the cinematic universe? How do you move that psychedelic, incredible imagery, uh, the dark dimension, Dormammu? How do you make that seem real? Uh, and one of the things that they established in the very first uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, which was Iron Man, was a mix of special effects and real effects, right? That they used models and then at key moments use special effects. So this is one of the things that makes it available for this general audience that doesn't have the background in the comic book reading experience that the hardcore fans have, that it feels real. And this is one of the things that you see uh, a return to in a lot of movies that have come out that are in this sort of pop culture landscape. I would argue this is one of the reasons why people did take to J.J. Uh, J. Ambrose's uh, The Force Awakens, Star Wars Force Awakens, he, he did return at some very basic level to models in key scenes as well as CGI. And so I think there's an emphasis on grounding that reality. And as, as Bill points out, 
when when you have an edgier, more experimental filmmaker, then you have the opportunity to see this sort of reality versus fantasy element explored. And that might be something that Marvel doesn't want to risk. Because, of course, when we think about Marvel's Cinematic Universe, we are thinking about a universe that's dominated uh, to a large extent by um, a kind of productive vision by Kevin Feige. And he's very much focused on that sort of middle of the road audience, as, as Bill points out. So we got another question. Yeah, I, I, I want to say a little more on this one, though, because it's really touching on my chapter. And I don't want to dwell exclusively on my chapter when I talk about the book in general. But my chapter is all about how uh, how the MCU has moved towards more mysticism. And as Julian said, it's grounded it, It's grounded in this science fiction approach. Uh, Thor makes a big deal that the Asgardians are scientifically advanced. They're not exactly gods, but they really are. And on a practical level, what Loki does is spellcasting, is magical. And, um, and gradually it builds up, it pushes and pushes the levels of plausibility. And so Doctor Strange is absolutely acting as a sorcerer. Uh, and the way it does that is by establishing this elaborate background, this elaborate history, and, well, this makes sense because it was already established in this other movie that such and such happens. Well, Thor is like a Norse god, and so why shouldn't there be uh, uh, spellcasting? Loki's doing his spellcasting, but Doctor Strange is very much like that. At a certain point, it doesn't matter whether it's science or it's magic. You just know what it does on the screen. And even with the, the latest mega hit from the studio you know, with Black Panther, if you remember the opening scroll, um, they, they make this sort of mystical origin for Vibranium. Like it's an asteroid that hits the Earth, but they're, the first Black Panther is led to it by the Bass, like the you know, Egyptian god Bass. And, and then from there they create all this technology. And how Vibranium operates in that movie is not exactly clear. Is it a metal? Is it something else? Is it in them? Is it in the soil? It's all these things, and it's a MacGuffin that works to help sort of like sell that story, but it's very much along the same line, where the science part of it, of course, is like, yeah, that's a really uh, powerful fighter jet, like the Royal Talon, or like the sort of animal-inspired designs for the flying ships, but at the same time, it also does things that metal aren't supposed to do. So it's a really sort of interesting thing. So I do want to get to um, Jack question. Jack's a former student around. He actually was in one of our first superhero comic book class. That's how old we are. Because now he has like a job. I think he's, he's a teacher. Yeah, right? he, Give he, a guy. He um, didn't ruin him for life. Yeah, that, that's, well, you know, I didn't ruin him. <laughs> um, Jack says, what were the biggest challenges in making this book a reality? You know, actually, Jack, this is a good question. Our publisher for this book is McFarland Publishers, a great publisher of popular culture. is one of the places um, well, once, we, once we finished uh, Age of Heroes, Heroes of Men, um, we really wanted to do a book with, with them. Um, the idea for this book is something that like immediately sort of popped into my mind, and I approached them, and they were like, oh, that's a really uh, interesting idea. So we had to go through a whole proposal process. We did that. Uh, and then we ran into a problem of publishing, right? Because... They are a major publisher, McFarland Publishers, a major publisher. If you know anything about popular culture, academic publishing, you know they have a huge catalog. They come out with, with really, literally hundreds of books in a year. Um, and they had another Marvel book. And I should have known this because like, I was writing a chapter on the Black Panther, and I was like, where's this being published? I didn't really, I was just writing this. It was a call of papers. I'm like, oh yeah, I really want to write this on Black Panther. And I was you know, doing this, and I was, it was going to another book on Marvel, for McFarland. And so that book was in front of our book. And we had a huge sort of like thing about that book has to come out first. And that book, it was about every adaptation of Marvel. It was called Marvel Comics into Film. It really touched on every kind of adaptation. It was very different from our idea, right? Like our idea uh, was to focus on Marvel Cinematic Universe because we see it as a distinct entity. And so we had to deal with that. So we kind of have to wait for that book to come out. And then we had to deliver our manuscript. So that's like a, a kind of like um, inside baseball academic publishing insight. Like yeah. and all along, other books are in your way. Yeah. And all along we had to make it clear to the publisher and, and clear 
for the audience of the book, uh, how our book is different. That it, 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 This is not just about any movie that adapts uh, Marvel characters, that this is specifically about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the product of Marvel uh, Studios, this interconnected series of books and er, of, of movies and television shows and various other media tie-ins, and how it's worthwhile looking at this as a distinct entity. It's not just superhero movies. It's not just Marvel superhero movies. It's a particular set of interconnected Marvel superhero movies. So we had a question from Marcy. Um, she said, hey guys, you mentioned originally looking for, for this kind of collection for history class, a freshman, uh, first, your first year multidisciplinary course. What kind of course do you think assembly would be good for? That's a really great question. Um, uh, we always thought about this in terms of uh, humanities and social sciences courses, I think. So we always uh, advocate that these would, this kind of book would be great for cultural studies courses, history courses, be very useful in sociology or English courses, um, and, and those kind of courses. Media courses, yes. I think it would also be interesting in media courses. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, cultural studies, American studies, a lot of our right. contributors are from those fields. Right. Yeah. Uh, but between us, uh, Julian's a historian, I was an English major, so we kind of cover those, those two poles from the outset were kind of our uh, focus. Uh, Julian's all about context, I'm all about text. And, uh, but we deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm all about. And he's all about text to the point that it's like an obsession. He, he, one day he's going to have a thing. He's going to become a supervillain because of something involving text. It's going to happen. You heard it here first. <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. You go on a dark road. When, when we te when it's librarian, I'm usually Bill. When we teach together, I'm Professor S, which is uh, a, a good supervillain name there already. <laughs> so um, with the idea of the book well in hand uh, one of the things that we always try to do is uh, provide support for the book we did this with our first book uh, Asia Heroes Eras of Men so if you go to asiaheroeserasofmen.com it'll take you to the book website and the same is true for Assembling the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, this book has a book uh, website, right? So it's called Assemble the MCU. And if you go there, what you'll see is that we're, we're putting material there to help people who want to teach with the book. Because one of the things we asked our contributors was to come up with a few open-ended questions that you can use, that the, that the instructor can use to use the book in class, right? So we always aim for this book to be a a book that would be a supplement to a 15 week standard semester so you know you have about 15 weeks in a semester most semester based systems uh, give or take whatever sort of like time you're taking at the end or time you're taking at the, uh, at the beginning um, and so you can use basically a chapter from this book uh, every week and so it's a good sort of supplement and if you're as we are teaching class you understand the need to have, be able to fit stuff in in that landscape um, but what to do with that stuff, how to spark conversation, is always a really uh, um, big question, right? So uh, we ask all our contributors to come up with some open-ended questions. We also are, are working, on some, working on some sort of like general questions for the collection at large. And when you go to the website, you'll see those start to roll out now that the book's available. And technically, the book is officially available yesterday. That's why we're doing this Q&A today. And, Unfortunately, Dan can't uh, be here. Daniel can't be here because, like, he's in Michigan and we're in Florida, and we did not figure out a way to allow him to do the uh, Facebook Live with us. And I feel like that was a technical failure on my part, but I'll figure it out next time. But um, he's going to do other stuff, and we're also going to be doing some interviews uh, with some outlets about the book as well. So look for those. But uh, keep your questions coming. We really appreciate it. I think we've got a few more. Yeah. Um, so, Michael Mendoza has a question. Um, 
Hi guys, in terms of organizing the section of the book, how did you decide on the justice seeking section and apparently broader cultural interpret cultural interpretation? Did you see other dominant themes your contributors were attached attracted to? Ah, well, this is a really great question. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we talked about uh, when we were conceiving the, the the pitch for the book was what was the definition of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so when we reached out to contributors we actually reached out to them with like, this is what we see as a Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is how we're conceptualizing it because we wanted to have greater coherence in our investigative approach to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As Bill mentioned, we think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a very particular way. We wanted to define it uh, through some, some things that we felt were very obvious. One of them, of course, is security. And um, our... The, the end editors were not the beginning editors. Our, our original trio was the true same trio we had on Ages of Heroes. It was men. Thomas Donaldson was uh, our original editor. And, and we talked a lot, the three of us, about this. And we really came up with um, that outline together. But Tom had some family issues and wasn't able to continue with the project. And Daniel um, stepped in um, because I knew him, and he stepped in to sort of complete the work that, that Tom had um, started. So with security as like a sort of baseline, we started to think about what are some of the issues that are spinning out of that in terms of like the cultural context and American experience. And I'll let Bill sort of like follow up on yeah, that. Yeah, we, we had the, at one point we were thinking of it as the three S's, and right. we had security, we had society, and uh, what was the, the third S was? Security, society... Uh, See that's why we stuff. got rid of these. Uh, <laughs> this happened but, every time. The, the, but it was it was but it was it, but, but really the the cultural the the creative aspect of the uh, MCU which was we had. It, it was it was or yeah it was I mean that, that was always kind of the that's yeah, what I, you wanted. That's, that's what was, <laughs> well, it's still kind of what we have in the three sections. We ha we have it, it, uh, we, we have looking at it. As right. as an artistic creation, as right. it, um, uh, we have so like at structure, it. structure, structure. That was structure. That was, that was it. Was structure, it was structure, security, no, no, structure, it was, society. It was me, security. that was all about the structure. Yeah, that was that was that. Was, that was, that was, was structure, security, and society. society. Um, uh, which. It, we can't even remember those ourselves, and we had acronyms <laughs> going for us. So uh, I, after much discussion, we came up with different labels, but I think those are still the uh, fundamental uh, divisions. Right. And they really just emerged organically from the contributions we got and the questions we thought were worth exploring. Right, so you remember um, we did both a general call, and we actually talked to people directly to get them to contribute essays. And so we had an opportunity to um, really get a, a strong sense of how people uh, were, were exploring some of these issues, which is why we have both an eclectic group of people, uh, scholars from all over the world that are, are contributors to the book, but also why there is this sort of coherence to the experience of reading the book. Um, so interconnectedness, he has like a question mark. Hmm. <laughs> What does that mean, Mike? Interconnected. <laughs> Interconnected. Is it, I think one of the chapters is called It's All Connected. connected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right, so one of the things about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that like, it is, in some ways, borrowed very heavily from the original print Marvel mm -hmm. Universe. Right. So this idea of the shared universe is a compelling element to both the fan experience of interacting with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also a compelling element of the story experience. And so mm -hmm. what does that mean in the context of the Marvel studio films versus uh, so licensed properties that are created for Marvel uh, characters. So the Fox universe, so all the X-Men movies, Logan, all that, those were licensed properties. And, and over the last few years, through the efforts of Simon um, Kinsberg, he sort of stepped up to be the sort of main sort of like visionary author, right? Like that he's really stepped in to help sort of create a coherence to the X-Men universe. Because at some very basic level, Fox was doubling down on its control of that license. And if you know anything about licensing, uh, you know that if you don't use the license, when you license something from a, a rights holder, you lose the license. This is why uh, when the Marvel Cinematic Universe started, 
and they didn't have uh, the license to Daredevil or Ghost Rider, and then they acquired them because um, even though people unfairly say the uh, Ben Affleck Daredevil movie is the worst movie they've ever seen, I want to stress that the director's cut is actually good. I always say this. Yeah, it, it, it's good. I, you know I can see you, right? Okay. So, okay. So the director's cut is worth your time. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, but Fox lost that. And they lost the, the rights to all these other characters. And so you got, uh, Marvel got them back and they had to figure out how to do them. And they made the decision to use the Netflix deal to bring those to, to the public. Which, again, carves out another sort of fictive area in their universe. Because in the very first show, in Daredevil, they referenced everything that happened in New York. And they actually, um, that... That whole there's an exchange in almost I think the first or second episode where they reference it and it, and the actual rebuilding element is sort of a direct con- uh, consequence of the Battle of New York in the Avenger film and even Agents of Shield Marvel's Agents of Shield on, a- on ABC is very much rooted in uh, spinning out of, of the Avengers and if you of course if you watch the second season um, Captain America uh, Winter Soldier was a huge sort of narrative point to that whole season, right? That that whole show shifted once that movie came out. And that meant, of course, that they had to have complete alignment between the production units that are doing television and the production units that are doing film. And the episode after the film uh, premiered was the episode where you find out about the Hydra infiltra- in, uh, infiltration of S.H.I.E.L.D., which gives you a prime example of how interconnected the Marvel Cinematic Universe is in a way that other properties owned by, uh, held, uh, licenses held by other producers are not. Right? And there, there's a failed attempt to do this with other things, I would argue, but yeah. Yeah, that's a different story. You want to talk about transmedia storytelling? Yeah, well, transmedia storytelling is, is you know, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, media scholar Henry Jenkins, he, he's talked about um, the idea of transmedia storytelling. And what that means is, of course, that each individual platform has the ability to, to tell a story and that you can tell a story across these platforms in a sort of coherent way and that for the, the audience, for the user, they're absorbing the story that you're telling in the specialized ways that each platform allows for that story to be absorbed. So um, I talked about this in class. This is part of the reason this came up because I, I gave a, a lecture on transmedia storytelling uh, and its antecedents in terms of like the, the student experience, of course, one of the prime examples of this is Star Wars. Lucasfilm has been a huge innovator in terms of transmedia storytelling. The original trilogy um, ended in the 1980s, but there was a whole universe of books and games that were built on that, and comics, right? Books, games, comics that were built on those stories, both interweaving stories between the original trilogy and doing ancient stories, the Dark Horse, uh, the Dark Horse series of comics, they were set thousands of years before uh, the original trilogy, and then you have all the all the books that were created after the trilogy, all of which got wiped away when when Disney acquired uh, Star Wars, by the way, and now they're doing their own thing. Um, so I'm not bitter because I was deeply invested in. Some of, some of that. But I'm not. I mean, because they're bringing those characters back. Some of them. Some of them. I think, them. I think in some ways, I mean, comic. It, the moment has come in the mainstream media for what's been going on in comic storytelling since the 60s. It, 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 in the 60s, you know, Stan Lee really uh, really made the, the watchword continuity uh, important. And I. I uh, continuity for Stanley, for Marvel, and then soon for the comics industry in uh, general, Marvel and DC, uh, uh, it served two purposes. It was a storytelling tool. It was a way of, well, if this story happens, it has consequences for these other stories. It makes a more engaging world. But it's also a marketing device. I want to. I, 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 I want to follow Iron Man's advent, adventures, and he did something in this issue of the Hulk. So now I've got to buy the Hulk, and so on and so on. 
And I think for Stanley, those were always inseparable. Stanley is a, a, a pitch man. He's always about uh, marketing. And um, he's always out to maximize sales. But there's an assumption that the way to maximize sales is to tell an engaging story. Right. And... I, I, I don't know why it took Hollywood so long to latch onto this strategy, uh, the, uh, uh, but but I think I think the current media environment really made the benefits of that greater and more apparent. That uh, there are there are not just the films, there are televisions, there's uh, the, the internet, there's uh, mobile streaming, devices. mobile devices, streaming, all of these different ways that uh, the media are infiltrating our entire lives and to have well, this <laughs> uh, permeating how about permeating that's a little less that's a little judgy less uh, 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 the media are permeating our entire lives and this is what transmedia uh, storytelling does is it just it creates this world that is just constantly engaging in so many different ways and so this is this is these are the characters. This is the universe with the most experience with that kind of immersive, uh, engaging environment, which is very well suited for our media moment. Jack had an additional question. I want to make sure that we answer. He asked, like, you know, who's the audience for this book? I well, I mean, primarily the academic uh, audience. I'd say that they, they were our primary target. It, it has its origins in what we wanted to do in class, but I think uh, there are a lot of obsessive superhero fans out there who are intelligent and interested in exploring different directions of these characters. And I think we always had in mind that we wanted this to be a book that would have appeal beyond the academic world uh, while still having academic credibility. Um, with, our first, with our first book, uh, that was kind of our hope, and it was priced at ridiculous academic textbook pricing, and <laughs> they've actually got a couple of uh, copies of it that have been sitting in my comic shop for years. I, I appreciate them giving the self space to us. Nobody's ever bought them, because <laughs> it's $80 for a book of... It, 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 at one it, point, it was $1,000. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I, oh, because it was on Amazon, and and you know how when a book is out of print, and in this case, our actual publisher for our first book was uh, Cambridge Scholars Publishing, which is actually in the UK. So it wasn't out of print; it just there wasn't a copy in the US, yes. and so there was a reseller, and they were selling it for a thousand dollars. And I saw that, and I was like. I'll sell you a copy for that. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, that's, uh, that's a deal. <laughs> yeah. That's the market forces that yeah. work for you. Yes. Uh, I agree with that. I think um, one of the things about um, all, of our, all of our sort of books is that they they're very very much grounded in an academic narrative, right? Like a teaching, you know, we're a teacher scholar community here at Rollins, and so we're you're deeply engaged in how these these characters are part of bigger discussions about uh, humanities and, and, and American culture and global culture. Uh, and always, when we teach a class, when I teach a class on comics, um, students are always disappointed because they don't read enough comics. And then, if, if, if you're obsessed with comics, you, we never read enough comics in these classes. If you hate comics, we read too much. So it's, it's a lose lose situation every time. But um, what we do is that we read comics and we read scholarly analysis of comics, right? And and we talk about the way comics operate, um, both as a text and also as, as as context. And so for the audience that's curious about superheroes and way different ways to think about them, right? Not to be so dismissive. Superheroes are kid stuff. Well, they're not really kid stuff. It's true, we associate superheroes in the United States with a juvenile audience, but that's an American, that's a U.S. conceit. Every other part of the world, comics are not necessarily a, a kid thing. Um, they are a legitimate literature that adults engage with. So some, some of the emphasis on children in, in comic books and comic-related culture in the United States is direct link to market. How is it marketed? Right? Um, while 
it's ironic because one of the first comic books was um, um, Fun Comics, which was basically more, a more, fun. more fun comics, which was basically uh, newspaper strips collected into the form that we understand to be comic books. And so when people talk about newspaper scripts, they often don't think about them as kid stuff. But they are deeply, they're drawn material, they're sequential art. Uh, and there's always this sort of like odd dichotomy between um, the newspaper comic strip curator and the sort of political themes could be there, the sort of cultural commentary that could be there versus the superhero comic, which apparently for people, well, that never is there. And that's just, that's just not true. That's a conceit of how... It's contextualized. Ha! Context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Context, yeah. Mr. Cut. <laughs> that'll, that'll be your super villain. No, 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 no. Are you super, you can, are you going to be here? You know. <laughs> I would say one of, one of the strengths, one of the appeals to uh, our work is I think that we have been open to the kind of appreciation of, uh, of comics that comes from fandom while holding it to an academic standard. If you look at older comics scholarship, there tends to be a very condescending, very critical, uh, in a negative uh, sense, view of things. You know, the early scholarship on comics, there's a lot of uh, Superman is a fascist. So the whole idea of this Superman who is superior to people is fascist. and And it's... You get the sense reading these things. These people actually haven't read a lot of the stories. They they are just approaching it from their academic theoretical framework and uh, from a superficial knowledge of the texts are are, are uh, casting judgment on it. And I think not just our book, but I think uh, comic superhero scholarship in general has slowly started appreciate it slowly started incorporating the perspective of a generation of scholars who have had more positive experiences with these things but also can see the negatives can see the limitations the the, the see these these social reflections and the whole range of uh, ideas expressed in their positive and negative and so I think it's it's scholarly work that fans will find some meaning in. So uh, we're getting about the half hour mark, and want to remind people that we're doing a Q and A here with myself, Julian Chambliss, Professor of History at Rollins College, and say your name, Bill Spadovsky, <laughs> librarian, <laughs> and we're talking about um, assembling the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so when I'm looking down, I'm looking at the computer where I'm making sure that I'm answering the questions and stuff like that. Uh, not that I don't care. I just want to make that clear because Bill, Bill, yeah, I saw that Bill. I can't see. Um, so uh, just, yes, this sort of station identification thing. Um, so we're reaching out to people uh, and answering, your, answering their questions. We have another question from Michael Mendoza. Do you think that Feige studio stewardship will continue to encounter similar creative disputes. Uh, right, Ant Man, Jenkins, mm -hmm. Thor, uh, Thor, The Dark World, which are similar to creative disputes in. Um, uh, let me let me go here. Similar to creative disputes in comics industry. Do you think this is an accurate corollary between film and comic industries? I actually think that this will continue to be a problem, but. It's not like the creative disputes in the comic industry. And what I mean by this is, um, in the history of Hollywood, uh, producer, fire, and director, huh, unheard of? No, not at all. What's interesting here, of course, is that, you know, in some ways, Kevin Feige is on an unprecedented run of success associated with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And much like the Marvel Comics print, right, print universe, there is a, a committee that is sort of like driving this narrative, right? Like they're, they're playing out this narrative in a collective manner. Uh, and they have writers that they go to over and over again, but they're, they're clearly um, thinking about this in terms of like, what are the next steps in these phases? What are the characters that we're, we're going to, to use? Where are we going to use them? This is why um, we often hear reports of actors when they saw, sign on to a Marvel movie 
often signing to something like um, six to nine appearances. And, I, and I've looked at this and decided that this breaks down to three appearances in your own movie, right? So if you're Thor, you get three Thor movies. Um, three appearances in some other movie, which is like you, you pop up in something. And then three appearances in something that's like line-wide, like you, you're in an Avengers or something like that. And, I mean, not be everything, but I think it, it, it it's a pretty accurate um, description of, of someone like Mark Robert Downey Jr. Um, but, you know, another char other characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe are clearly connective characters, right? So Nick Fury was the first connective character, and I would argue that... Um, Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson, is the second most connected character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the connected characters are really, actually really important in a shared universe environment. Like, so people will, I totally understand that people are like, why does Scarlett Johansson have a movie of her own? But I would point out, look at the movies Scarlett Johansson is making, how much money they made, and go, if you're an accountant, go like, is this worth my money? Right, like, that's not a knock on Scarlett Johansson as an actress or a human being or a woman. It's a, it's a question about when does the return on investment hit? And that's never been talked about in, in, in terms of why she doesn't have a movie. And that's a huge thing for Kevin Feige, obviously, because he controls the budgets. He controls... He, he, he has a, a firm control over this. And so... Having her as a connective character, though, is incredibly helpful. She she adds something to every film she's in that no one else can add. The same thing is true of Nick Fury. Yeah, it's really changed the whole model of movie stardom, that you don't have to be the central character of a single movie to be a star at this point. Um, and that, that's very different from how Hollywood has generally operated in its history. Um, but I, I would say that the Marvel movies, they're not auteur director uh, movies. And, right. uh, and yet, there are some interesting creative dimensions that come into the, the movies, and I think those, those dimensions are important. And so I, in some ways, I think the, the uh, conflicts between Feige and the directors are, are a feature, not a bug. Um, it's right. unfortunate when they lose a director like Riot, but... I would like to see them continue to get adventurous in their choice of directors, and then if 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 a director is taking a project in a way that's not going to build the universe, that's not going to fit, maybe that that relationship has to end. They have to come to the end of a road. I would hate to see them give up. I would uh, I, I, and only go for uh, by the book uh, uh, creators who are going to just give us it's an entirely predictable product. Uh, but I, uh, but I wouldn't want to see them go the the art theater direction where uh, David Lynch produces a uh, movie uh, of Iron Man that's completely incomprehensible and has nothing to do with anything we know about any of the other Marvel characters. That's not. Gonna, I love David Lynch, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like sure it would be brilliant. Be brilliant yeah. But it wouldn't build a strong. I love David Lynch's universe. Dune. But I wouldn't want him to see he, he, yeah. him doing. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I think Star, I, Wars, Star Wars is having this conflict right now yeah, with yeah, The Last yeah, Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Is that it's, it, it, it does something very different than what we could think George Lucas would have done. But ironically mm. there, the, the producer, Kathleen Kennedy, is perfectly fine with what happened. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think another thing here is like, you know, Michael's question is like, is this like the, the problem of creative disputes in comics? No. The reason I say it's not like that is because... Um, the most classic form of creative dispute in comics is the creator who writes, like, you know, who's profiting from this. Um, this is really a question of collaboration. And film filmmaking is a collaborative exercise. Comics is a collaborative exercise. It, but filmmaking is really a collaborative exercise. And what you see from hearing how directors of the Marvel Cinematic Universe describe their experience in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they often talk about I went in and I, and, I, and I pitched something and they liked it or they didn't, right? And, and then once they say they like it, they help as much as they can. So it's not like they go like, don't do that shot, do this shot. They say, don't do this. This is out of character. 
which is a perfectly reasonable thing to say. And I would argue this is one of the things that makes the Marvel Cinematic Universe work from an audience perspective, that they remain very closely concerned with, is this in character with this character? Like, it, would this happen in an Iron Man comic? Not that it's the exact same thing, but it's the tone. Like, it's like an emotional tone. Like, and, and, and that's part, and this goes to the question, another question that, that, that Jax asked, is, is that there are reports that finally no, uh, Kevin Feige no longer re, uh, reports directly to Alan Horn at Disney Studios. He's bypassed the Marvel creative, co- creative Committee. Is that good or bad for the MCU? Now, uh, this is why Jack is a former student. That deep geek knowledge, Jack. I I I nod my head to you, and, and my heart swells with pride. Um, two, I do. I was initially really worried about this. Um, the Marvel Creative Committee was made up of a, a whole group. Many of them were Marvel writers. They had um, some um, relationships. They were animation, so. They, they would get together and look at whatever Marvel products there were and give feedback and input and help m- map it out. But Ike Permer, Permer, Permutter. Permutter, I always get his name badly, uh, butcher his name, who's the publisher of Marvel, is um, by reports, I've never met the man, I am not saying anything about but by reports, was difficult for Kevin Feige to work with. Now, whether or not these reports are true, um, at some point, though, as, as, as Jack well points out, he reported that he no longer has to deal with this committee and he, he deals directly with the head of Marvel uh, or the head of Disney. Now, I think one of the things that makes Kevin Feige a really effective steward for Marvel Cinematic Universe is that he has a long experience with Marvel property, starting when he was working um, years and years ago on, for uh, Arby Abbott, right, and Marvel Entertainment. So it's not like he doesn't know Marvel things. In fact, he knows them and loves them. So I, I do think that that's, that's one part of it. The other thing is that within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's so old now and so developed that there's a sort of cluster of people who know the Marvel Cinematic Universe and they know that narrative structure and that narrative goal. And so they're referencing that now, right? And this was always the case in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you look at the movies and you know the comics, you know they make changes. Right, they they do things that make sense in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They're not like the comics, but they're not attempting to directly do the comic. They're attempting to capture the tone and the values associated with the comic, and I think they often do that. So, you know, yeah, I I would say that one place where the Marvel movies do mirror the comics is the the idea of authorship. That uh, something uh, uh, comics uh, have done uh, in their earlier history is to really obscure the idea of an author. That, that it, uh, it wasn't until the 60s that comic book writers and artists got any sort of credit in a comic book. Um, uh, and to this day, the average person on the street probably thinks that Stan Lee created each and every Marvel character and each and every Marvel story. And the, and the movies even uh, perpetuate this myth with the, the uh, Stan Lee cameos. Um, and uh, yet these, they're the product of many very talented creators. Um, and, and and I think that we're seeing the same thing in the movies. Is, uh, it, it, we could look at uh, Kevin Feige as the, the author of the Marvel Universe. He's certainly been the unifying, uh, driving force of the general tone of uh, this, uh, this set of uh, creations. And yet there are many other contributors who are giving their individual strengths to each of these uh, separate projects. So, um, Michael Kennedy had a, another question that we... we Never got to it. So he says, superhero has been used to, cre- to critique some aspects of social reality while letting other things off scot-free. It took so long, for instance, for the Black Panther to confront white supremacy, but not, but not just white extremism. How does this new complex interplay between cinema, TV, comic books, 
affect the quality of social critique? I think it's a really good question. I think one of the things that um, you started to see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that in different um, platforms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that there are better social critiques. So I would argue that if you look at the Netflix shows, that their gender is much more effectively handled than um, in the movie. Because, of course, you have Jessica Jones and, you know, the, the season two of Jessica Jones just dropped uh, and it's been lauded very much for its its portrayal of Jessica Jones and dealing with things like uh, trauma and, and, and the male perspective, the male gaze and all these things. And, and so in that Netflix universe, there, there have been really sophisticated critiques. I would argue that uh, one of the recurring themes in the first season of Daredevil was gentrification. And um, this was, you know, to the point that they had uh, the power broker on the shelf behind um, Wilson Fisk in an episode. I'm like, you can't, you can't get deeper than that. I mean, if you're an urbanist like me, you know, every urbanist out there, like, really, they have power broker? Like, yes, they have power broker on the shelf. So <laughs> it gives you a sense of like the level of like, there's a commentary here. On a built environment, of course, Wilson Fisk's goal of like he wants to make the city great uh, at the expense of like all the people in all the poor people in his way, uh, which is you know it's a little a classic uh, urban renewal critique. So I think that in that context, that there is um, a more effective ability to deal with complex social issues because they're doing it in an episodic way, whereas in the films, I think they told they've totally blown over. Stories that are very important to comic book fans in terms of like their their attachment to like socially relevant issues. Prime example of this to me is Iron Man and Demon in a Bottle. So before Iron Man Two came out, there were a lot of people saying they're going to do Demon in a Bottle on Iron Man Two, and I was like, they're not going to do Demon in a Bottle because I actually read Demon in a Bottle. Demon in a Bottle, Iron Man is an alcoholic. He is a full on alcoholic. He literally almost dies in the street. His homeless friend dies in his arm. I'm like, this is a PG-13 film, and the tone of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is relatively positive. Uh, they are not going to do Demon in the Bottle. That is a classic story. It's very important to Iron Man lore, but you're not going to see that in a Disney movie that's PG-13. And indeed, there are allusions in Iron Man 2 that he drinks too much. Right, like he, yeah, he, Iron Man Two has some very ugly drunk scenes, right, but yeah. that's as close that's as they're going to get. Yeah, right. Like he, he, there, there's no AA meetings. There's no, you know, Iron Man is an alcoholic in comics. He remains an alcoholic. Um, in Civil War Two, he needed to find a meeting. Right, like the great story of Civil War Two, where he, at the end of that story, he ends up in a coma, and that opens the way for uh, Lionheart or Ruby Williams, the African American. Um, stand in, uh, who becomes Ironheart, who's an armored character. Um, but he needs a meeting and, and, and can't, can't find a meeting that um, Captain Marvel, uh, Carol Danvers, who's also an alcoholic and he's her sponsor, and she needs a meeting. They end up in the same meeting and end up almost fight. I mean, so it's an integral part of his character in comics. Not so much in movies because that's not what they do in those movies. Um, I, that's my thought on that. I'd be interested to hear what Bill thinks about. Yeah, that. well, I, yeah, I mean, I ultimately, they want something that's going to be a fun blockbuster viewing experience, and uh, to, to, to have Tony Stark go for an entire movie or really more than one movie would be in the gutter. Well, uh, it, 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 it's not good for ticket sales. It's not going to sell toys to the kids. Right. Um, uh, but they, uh, what was it? What was the question we started with? <laughs> it was, um, it's about the social critique. The social critique. Yeah, well, like, well, I wanted to say something about uh, that. That I mean, I mean, certainly the internet has changed the game there. That uh, fans have a more immediate, uh, prominent voice. But this is something that again goes back to comics. That. Uh, 
comic book letter columns, uh, which uh, started in the 50s with EC Comics, and then uh, Mark Weisinger uh, introduced them in the Superman books at DC in the early 60s, and Stan Lee uh, was very quick to jump on that. Right. And that sort of relationship with the fans was huge in shaping comics. It's become a much more immediate relationship in the age of the internet, where somebody can be uh, tweeting about the movie that they're sitting in right now. It's very, very rude. <laughs> not, to, not, not very Disney, rude not, to be on your phone. Not a Disney movie, movie because, like, they take. Well, at least at the premiere, they take your phones. That, well, they should. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, afterwards, it's 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 a, yeah, an important thing. Is a thing. Uh, we have a question about uh, Stan Lee, and it's like, um, have they created? 3D models of Stan Lee, will he be able to do his cameos forever? On the surface, this seems like a silly question, but it's a really good question, um, um, Meryl. It, there is a company uh, called Digital Domain in Hollywood that has, uh, they do 3D models of actors. And they won't tell you who they're doing 3D models of, but it's, it's a high definition 3D model of actors that could conceivably be imported into films. I'm, I'm going to guess that Stanley hasn't done this um, because he's an older man and he's not really an actor. He's more of a showman and doesn't, doesn't conceive of him his image being used in films later on. Um, but I would say some of these actors in, in these films probably have done it. I would say Robert Downey Jr. definitely has probably done it. Um, there was actually a story about this on Marketplace, on NPR, where they were, they were mentioning this, right? And we're rapidly getting to a place where uh, digital performances are, are incredibly important to, to modern film. Andy, Andy Serkis, of course, is a really important character, actor, who rose to fame for his work on Lord of the Rings. All the motion capture work also in Planet of the Apes. It's only with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, ironically, that he's finally get to like, show his face, right? Because he's Claw. He was Claw in Black Panther. Uh, and then before in uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. So I, I do think that for some of these actors, this is going to be a thing. Uh, of course, famously, this is about dead actors. This is mm -hmm. primarily concerned about dead actors. I know I was personally shocked and amazed when I saw um, uh, Rogue One and looked and saw I was like... Oh, is, is that they, they resurrected Peter Cushing <laughs> for this? <laughs> I'm like, that's a really good character actor, great makeup. But the more I looked at it, you know, one of the things about this is that when you do uh, digital enhancements, they did it in Blade Runner in 2049. Um, there's often this thing called the uncanny valley, where where you're looking at something that's digital and you know it's not real. Right, this is why you become uneasy with it, and you, so, you know the 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 logic there is like, don't try to make it look human. Make it look like a machine; it'll be easier. Um, yeah, like, yeah, and Christopher Johnson like Uncanny Valley yeah. Land looks off, right? Yeah. And then for that one, somehow it was probably easier to do with a dead person. I don't know why I, why that worked. I think she just de-aged Leo. Nah, I think yeah. maybe yeah. I, 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 I did try to de-age Leo. Yeah. Uh, um, Rogue One is a whole different gun. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's the lighting in the Leia scene, actually. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think this might be something in the future. But no, I would yeah. say no. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, I think Hollywood is an industry. I, I think they realize the tremendous threat that CGI faces to making all of them unnecessary. And I think this is something as a society. I mean, certainly librarians are worried about being replaced by Google. And uh, <laughs> are you? Worried? Well, well, I mean, I, I, I think it, you know, it, it's the, the the worries come and go over the years, and we found new ways to find it. Now, this is, I don't need to go into the, the librarian <laughs> feel right now. With that, well, the libraries are the threat. The libraries are the threat. No, we're still we're still useful, but because we this because we've taken the threat seriously. Uh, but I think I think Hollywood is taking this seriously. Of if they can just uh, capture everybody's image and generate performances uh, endlessly, what does this do? Uh, why why uh, why cast this living actor when Humphrey Bogart's available? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I yeah, well, well, that's a rabbit hole. Um, 
I, I do think this is it, it's a legitimate question. I, yeah. I, I don't yeah, know that yeah. the computer technology yeah. exists right now, but yeah. it's clearly on the road. Yeah. Right? I mean, um, one of the things that they do do in, in films now is they de-age people all the time. Yeah. And that's really interesting. Yeah, but and that's I, been, I did, that was great in Ant Man where we could have yeah, you know, Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas. Young. Um, yeah, we well, have let's, another let's, question uh, here. I, I, I just want to go back for one second to, no. the, to the Stan Lee side of the no. question. And, and, no. and I think it's an no. inter- just an interesting no. question. How, no. how are they going to no. brand themselves without Stan Lee? Um, I want CGI, but Jack Kirby. You, Marcy asked, is there, you think Robert Downey Jr.'s substance abuse problem? Uh, Made that uh, basically she's asking, do you think Robin Downey Jr. Sullivan and Douche Audible may also kept Iron Man's portrayal on those issues more subdued? That is a good good point. Yeah, I you know yeah I think I think in some ways it allowed them to be more subdued because I think I think in some ways people who know anything about Robert Downey Jr. can read into Tony Stark some of the underlying issues of the character. Um, I, 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 there's been so much just incredible casting in the movies and, and and that all started with Robert Downey Jr. who practically is Tony Stark in so many ways and, <laughs> and, 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 and you know and I, they got him at a low point in his career where they, at, at a point where it was really kind of slumming to take a superhero role and he changed the model yeah I think I think part of the reason that he worked as Iron Man because like he had so spectacular failures. He was really difficult to be insured, and they had to convince them to hire him. But he delivered, and that transformed his career. Um, and oh, I didn't think a performance could be sustained, but maybe a cameo. You're right. I think maybe a cameo can be sustained, but you yeah. know, at some level, he says stuff. I mean, it is a performance. Yeah. They're usually yeah. not but that. But the, the Netflix things are incorporating Stanley without him doing live action and yeah. things. And there are certainly ways they could fit him in, and. You, you know, at some point, Stanley could become like Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse rarely actually appears as a character anymore. He's become a logo. And St- uh, Stanley has always made, made his name a, a marketing point. I, I, I think it's it would be a fitting immortality for Stanley to uh, just be a little point of branding and. They could, I, I could easily imagine them fitting in some sort of references with CGI or uh, whatever. Um, I, on the other hand, I personally would like to see... Stanley has gotten his share of attention for the Marvel Universe. And he did, he's very... I, I, I'm not a Stanley hater. I think he, he's done, he changed comics. He's changed movies now. Uh, but there are other people worth giving credit to in these things, too. So, uh, we're getting to the end of an hour. Uh, we have a question from Chris. He says, um, has Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and his apparent absence from the MCU been discussed? Well, um, mm-hmm. of course, we have um, some chapters in the, a chapter in the book that talks about um, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And, of course, the, the transformation of S.H.I.E.L.D. as an organization in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is very much shaping the narrative of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on television. In many ways, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was always a really complicated exercise because it was on ABC. Uh, the budget for that was always a problem. Uh, I personally think it would been a huge success if you think about the, the problem of trying to have a television show connected to a movie budget, movies with movie budgets. It was always uh, a tough sell. Um, but I do think that uh, because... The idea of the of, of Shield has been sort of like dismantled in the movies. What you see in the television show is the consequences of that, with characters, uh, primarily Agent Coulson, uh, sort of carrying the narrative. Right, not a lot of overlap anymore in Marvel Agent Shield. Although I do I do think that they're still using it to introduce some ideas because they're all about the Kree this season, and that only makes sense if they're going to loop back into some other narrative connected to Captain Marvel, in my opinion. I mean, a lot of it is is the politics behind the scenes, the the split between Ike Perlmutter and uh, Kevin Feige, and I think that's been unfortunate uh, in uh, what is supposed to be a shared universe, and they're not sharing very well. Um, uh, but uh, 
there remain uh, there remain ties there uh, uh, even um, in, in the shift toward mysticism that I was talking about earlier about the point that uh, Marvel was headed towards Doctor Strange we had Ghost Rider showing up on Agents of Shield there are, uh, they they aren't managing a tight moment to moment continuity between television and the movies but they're both taking advantage of a shared setting. Um, so, uh, it's a problem, but it does, it, I, I think it, it remains a, a clearly a profitable, successful application of this idea of a shared universe. Yeah, they don't have a, a, a real problem. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not an economic problem, so that's the only problem they're looking nope. at. Yeah. Uh, so, they're crying all the way to the bank. Right. <laughs> Um, it'll be interesting to see if this continues. At some level, we're, we're approaching a major moment with the Avengers of Infinity War. Um, by most accounts, uh, this is the the culmination of the driving sort of like architectural element of the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, since its creation, with the Infinity Stones and and, and, and Thanos being in the background. Um, by all accounts, there's supposed to be some major reordering of the narrative after this, and primarily the, this this fixation has been about uh, who's going to be killed. Like, is is Robert Downey Jr. going to leave? Is Chris Evans going to leave? There are rumors that both of them will leave. Um, one or both of them will leave um, because they're in their contract, because they both have, they've done all that they can. Also, because like they're they're expensive, right? So, if you're Kevin Feige, it makes sense to phase them out, um, much like he, at the end of uh, Avengers, you got new Avengers, right? Like, you, 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 you introduce new characters. It makes sense to shift the narrative and bring in new characters who are cheaper and, and move the narrative forward in some way. And so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. They, they have so many options. They can, they can switch characters, and certainly there's plenty of precedent in the comics for different characters taking over the identity of these heroes. Or they can simply recast, which they've already done with Bruce Banner. And they can mix it up however they want. They can, sw they can switch. Rhodey can be in the Iron Man armor for a few movies, and then they'll bring in a new Tony Stark, and uh, people might be more willing to accept another actor in the role at that point. Who knows? We don't know. Uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we only scheduled this for an hour, and and we went over time, but we really appreciate it. Um, Jack had a question: Are there signed copies of the book available? You have to show up to a, a signing or a event, and and perhaps one or both of us will will be there to sign it. Uh, Bill's doing a a reading at Seminole State College, uh, doing a presentation. Uh, the Oviedo campus on right. March March twenty second, I think. March it'll be, it'll be on the page for the book. Yeah, uh, on March twenty second. Um, I'm out and about, uh, but I haven't scheduled anything uh, related to suddenly Marcel Mangrove. Although I will be speaking at the um, Orange County History Center this Sunday, so I might I might take some copies of the book and and um, so sort of like sign them maybe I'm not really set up to I to prepare for that uh, but um, thanks for taking the time to listen to us ramble on I really appreciate it remember that we have a website for the book called assemblethemcu.com it's assemble the MCU assemble not assembling it's assemble the MCU.com we're also on Twitter um, assembling the M assembling I think it's assembling the MCU there too as well. Um, and so, and of course, we have our Facebook page. So look for the Facebook page. We're always posting stuff there and continuing selection. Also, check out our, our previous volume, Ages of Heroes, Eras of Men, Superheroes in the American Experience. That's still available via Amazon. Um, yes, Chris. Uh, that's why we use Facebook Live. It, this will be here forever, haunting us. You, you can watch the whole thing. Um, and thanks for everyone who watched and thanks for your questions and we're off to, to lunch. Peace.